I was going to mention, you know, the Fillmore East becoming the Church of Rockology or whatever. Yeah, yeah, the Church. Uh, of there's a, you know, how it was groomed into that greatness, though, was stuff happening on the West Coast at the, the Fillmore, Fillmore West. The Fillmore West in San Francisco. Yeah. Also owned by Bill Graham, correct. He perfected the sound system there. Yeah. And he really perfected the light show there. A guy yeah. named Danny, I forget his last name, uh, Danny Williams developed okay. that uh, famous light show. And of course, it, it became bi coastal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that whole thing, that's when Fillmore East really took off. And, you know, we're talking about a crowd of 2,300 something, right? Yeah. yeah. Versus on the West Coast, see, they only had a thousand three at the Fillmore West. Yeah. So talk about intimate crowds. This oh, yeah. set yeah. you up for some awfully great recording, which I'm sure you're going to be bringing out. It's like you said, I mean, Bill Graham demanded excellence, not just from yeah. the performers, but from his own crew. But when the former performers got there and they saw you know, how he ran such a tight ship, they wanted to give their best, you know? Yep. So it just all fed on itself, and everybody gave their best performances. It was just incredible. And Led Zeppelin, who yes. uh, kind of got their act together down in L.A. Right. Uh, by right. playing with the likes of Alice Cooper and all of that, really hitting it for the first time after most right. of their tour, right. what, their first tour was over. Right. They polish it in San Francisco, baby. And, right. uh, you know, the papers were a buzzing. Right, right. And they just the crowning achievement achievement oh. on the East Coast oh, at uh, Fillmore you. East. The Who, Jefferson Airplane. I mean, oh. I mentioned the Grateful Dead, but everybody, there was nobody that wasn't playing there. Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Iron Butterfly. I mean, let's see. Led Zeppelin made four appearances opening for Iron Butterfly. <laughs> but you know, Led Zeppelin were at first was opening for a ton of people. Yeah. Uh, sure. Vanilla Fudge and uh, all sure, of the Fudge. bands got to the point, Royce. They didn't want Led Zeppelin opening for them. They, you know, it oh, yeah, was no. like. Who wants to follow no, Led Zeppelin? Nobody <laughs> wanted to watch them after that. Yes, he hired the bands. I, I didn't find anything about him having people working for him that went and hired, hired the bands. So I would assume that uh, Bill Graham did hire the bands. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any information on that. I always assumed that uh, it was Bill Graham's magic touch, his personal touch. Uh, you yeah. know, he was famous for courting the talent treating him yeah. like kings he could also treat him like uh garbage if they got on his bad side you know he was no angel but from <laughs> what i uh, i have all what do you think bruce do you know anything about that i mean i've heard the same thing like you know th these places it's the topography of rock and roll so i mean it's like every documentary you see like you read books on right right Lynn cream it's all in there and like similarly, yeah. Bill Graham is one of these figures that there are bands that had beautiful relationships with him, loved him. And then, yeah, I mean, there have been criticisms as well, you know, for those that right. kind of got, you know, because he could be stern, you know, strict as far as, you know, as, as well as you can imagine, you know, being in that business where you had to be have a little bit of that shark element to you as well. Also, right. So, so I've heard a mix of stories when it comes to, to Bill Graham. And I always just kind of assumed that he was just like one of those guys that saw a buck in everything but he truly loved <laughs> yeah. the music he loved the idea right. of show business and right. but everything he saw the angle i think in almost everything he did you know right. even on what he was going to have for lunch jefferson airplane live at the fillmore east recorded 1968 released in 1998, Janis Joplin, Fillmore East, 1969, recorded February 69, released in June 2022. When I started oh, I looking at this stuff, it kind of blew my mind. Man, if they, you know, it's better to get this stuff all transferred digitally and everything. Let's get it out. Because yeah. it's yeah. never, you go, oh yeah, now we need 42 albums by, you know, <laughs> Peter, Paul and Mary or whoever, right? right? right well, right. yeah, yeah. Because guess what, folks? <laughs> it's never freaking gonna happen again.
So this is history. This is musical history. Get it out, man. Look, look at Angela here. Uh, they should release the 17 encores by CCNR. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would buy that in a heartbeat. <laughs> I would too. <laughs> Great comment, Angela. Thank you. They probably did the long version of Suzy Q, huh? <laughs> that was the first single. The first time I had ever heard Creedence was Suzy Q. Blew me yeah. away because, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it oh, almost wow. had... When he goes into that, oh, shoes, you know, oh, yeah, the megaphone. Yeah. It, it, you got to remember right around that time we had Winchester Cathedral, oh, yeah. Winchester. you know, that sound. And so, right. and yet the very, they never that quite sounded point, like yeah. Susie Q again, right. did they? Right. Winchester right. Cathedral, that's the first a uh, song I played on the trumpet in the elementary school band. Well, you know, uh, just a couple of years ago, I'm going to check here to see what it was. Yeah, 8,500. Uh, uh, I went to go see Greta Van Fleet at okay. the uh, Bill Graham Civic Center. Right. And uh, there, that, that holds 8,500 people. Okay. Now, compare that to the Cow Palace, where I saw McCartney in 76. Right. 16,500 people. Okay. One thing that I noticed at the uh, Bill Graham uh, concert the uh, at the Civic Center with Greta Van Fleet was, wow, this is kind of, it had almost an intimate feel to okay. it. All right. right. So right. now think about the Fillmore East and West. I mean, you've got... 2,000, 2,500 probably, you know, they probably got 2,500 people. What a freaking intimate concert and series of concerts those must have been. Can you oh, imagine yeah. being yeah. in those con in the yeah. in that co audience, man? It's just yeah. awesome. But that was oh, one of the Stones concerts I, I did get to see live. 1972, I guess. Yeah. Long Beach. 72. Arena. Great yeah. time to see them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great time. And of course, uh, Bridges to Babylon. Um, I, that was another concert tour I got to see. Anyway, I would have loved to have seen that concert too, because I I think that good. that album gets a lot of uh, it, it. It doesn't get its due to right. for me. You know, uh, it's I think it's a great album. I, I think they made better before it, but I don't think they've made better since. And. Yeah. Uh, it right. was a strong artistic statement. It was uh, finely crafted songs. The band sounded sharp and a total enjoyment to listen. I mean, it's one of those albums you put on and you listen to it all the way through and you're entertained all the way through. You put a Stones album on like Led Zeppelin, The Beatles and most of our favorites. Well, you listen to it all the way through. You're not skipping. It's not Sticky Fingers voice, uh, obviously. No. You know, I right. mean, it's, it's not their... Uh, it doesn't travel like exile it uh, you know there's a lot of stuff that it doesn't pass up but dude the time it came out how old they were when they they put that album i think it's a valid damn stones album when you start thinking about all the songs that they've had that were just oh yeah just iconic songs you know and you know the, the thing is as long as the beatles were there they were one band but when the beatles dissipated right they got better not as far as writing hits i mean those hits in the 60s are just incredible but yeah. the band as a performing band live and now making almost grown-up al albums all on their own and nobody could say oh they got the idea from oh wait a minute those guys are gone now you know, right, Sticky right. Fingers, uh, that's what that album kind of just said to me, you know, when I heard that. One of these long histories that there's multiple eras to really enjoy. I've always been more partial to the, the Brian Jones era. Me too. But then, you know, you have that early 70s run that's like, you know, yeah. phenomenal. And I would right. argue too that, you know, Michael, you were talking about like Bridges to Babylon. That, I think that latter era of Stones, I continue to like all the singles also that were released. I don't think they released any Duff singles in that latter period either. Yeah. And you know, people and, always have their favorites as far as the eras and stuff, but I think they continued 
to still hold a very high quality and a very high standard of output. Yeah, Bruce, I agree. And what about their latest single? Would somebody please tell me what's wrong with living in a ghost town? That's a great track. I yeah, mean, I that's a classic Stones track. I loved it. And talking about having something to freaking say in, you know, the 21st century, I mean, that, oh, I love that track. I'm still waiting for the album. Mm-hmm. 